Borderlands, a game built on its legacy of guns, gore, and a goddamn terrible movie. But mostly guns. In this challenge, I will be playing through all of the original Borderlands game with only unique items. What is a unique item? In Borderlands, there are several rarities of item. Common, uncommon, rare, very rare, and legendary. Represented with the colors white, green, blue, purple, and orange, respectively. But there's also a special kind of item that transcends these ratings. And those are unique items. In Borderlands 1, most unique items can actually come in many rarities usually from uncommon to very rare. Oftentimes, they will have some small attribute that sets them apart from other items of a similar ilk. For instance, take this gun, the Ladyfinger. It can drop in rarities from green to purple, and its special attribute is granting an extra 100% critical hit damage. The thing that sets apart unique items from others is actually the parts that make up the item, you see, in the game's code, each item is actually made up of a group of parts, and these parts determine how the item behaves in-game. Unique weapons are actually made by just a single part, the rest of which are mixed and matched as normal. Using the Ladyfinger example from before, the part that determines this weapon is the barrel, as seen here in the weapon code. The challenge is to go through the entire game with only items that have these unique parts, and just to make it a little more difficult, I'm not limiting this challenge to only weapons, but all item slots. Weapons, shields, grenade mods, class mods, the whole nine yards. Now this has a couple of implications. Firstly, there are no unique grenade mods or class mods in the game, meaning that neither of those items can be used. However, I've allowed one exception. In the General Nox DLC, each character gets four additional class mods, one for popular, somewhat niche builds, and three that act as buffs for specific manufacturers of guns or other items, known as Enhancement or Allegiance class mods. The three Enhancement class mods for each class are exceedingly rare, basically only dropping from Cromorax, the raid boss of Borderlands. But that niche class mod? Each one does have a drop source that can be farmed, even in playthrough 1. I actually made a highlight video about farming Lilith's specific class mod a couple of years ago. It was... painful. Anyway, I'm allowing any of the class mods specific to that Nox DLC, because of their rarity and the fact that it's an endgame DLC anyway. Anyway, let's get started. Now when you start a game in Borderlands 1, you actually get a weapon in your inventory. And I didn't know this at the time, but this weapon is actually technically unique. Similar to the starting pistol in Borderlands 2, it has a unique part that is special to these character starter weapons. Roland gets an assault rifle, Lilith gets an SMG, Mordecai gets a sniper rifle, and Brick gets a shotgun. However, I didn't know that these were uniques at the time, and so I ended up only using melee for the first few levels. Whoops. Don't worry, the challenge isn't going to be any easier because of this. Heading up to Firestone, you'll notice we're going down a lot, and that's pretty normal. Anyone who's ever done a melee-only challenge in Borderlands 1 knows that until you get a shield, it's pretty brutal, but we'll get some useful items that'll help later. We clear Firestone of bandits and open up Zed's shack, and he's got work for us right away. We've got to go kill five skags. On the way, Claptrap gets gunned down in the streets of Los Angeles, but we give him a band-aid and he gets right back up, opening the gate for us. We slaughter five skags and save and quit to get back faster and reset some of the item lockers. In this next mission, we need to go fix a shield vendor and purchase a shield. This is where most people get their first shield, but since these shields are not unique, we won't be using them. Next on Zed's grocery list, clearing out the bandit kit that's literally across the street. Convenient. We take them all out, no issue, getting the chain killer challenge complete and grabbing all the items we can to sell before save quitting again. Challenges in Borderlands 1 are very different from Borderlands 2. Instead of badass ranks and tokens, Borderlands 1's challenges just provide your character with a set amount of experience, usually ranging from about 1,000 to 20,000. This XP is very valuable in the early game, and it's one of the reasons I'm save quitting so much, as we get more progress towards these challenges because certain things like item lockers and enemies respawn. Anyway, now we meet the best character in all of Borderlands, TK Baja and he, in turn, gives us his grocery list. 
The entire game's list of story missions is basically just completing grocery lists for people until you find the first piece of the vault key. We get his meat and get to level 5. At level 5, we get our first skill point, allowing us to get our action skill, the Scorpio Turret. This turret doesn't do a lot of damage, but it still has a very useful application in taking the attention of enemies away from me. Upon buying some grenades, we finally get our first mission with a boss, and access to our first unique weapon, the Ladyfinger. It's not a terribly powerful weapon, but the bonus damage on crit makes it decent, and, well, it's a lot better than just melee. So now, finally, with our first gun, we can head to take out our first boss, Nine Toes. Up to the fight, I was thinking about the best way to tackle it. Alright, so my strategy for this next fight is going to be uh, DPS down Nine Toes with the Ladyfinger, and then throw Scorpio Turret, and then nade the dogs, pretty much. You woke the wrong dog. Actually, I think I'll start off with Scorpio turret. Yeah, let's start off with Scorpio turret. Scorpio turret. DPS down nine toes. That didn't take long. With nine toes down, we now get our second unique weapon, the Clipper. It's an incendiary pistol with a high rate of fire. It's not great that both of our weapons are pulling from the same ammo pool, but the fire damage over time will be useful for quite a while given how many flesh enemies this game has. We turn the quest in to TK Baja, who then tells us to talk to Zed, who says we need to get a job, and as it turns out, that leads us back to TK Baja. Just a little roundabout. The next enemy we need to take down to progress the story, Bonehead, is going to be level 11, and we need all the XP from missions, kills, and challenges we can get in order to close the gap from our level 6 character. We pick up the Why Are They Here mission, forget to grab the first data recorder, and head to the second one and Scar, which are conveniently right next to each other. We encounter Scar, who immediately nearly bodies me, but we make short work of him afterwards using our newly acquired fire weapon. From here, we can go grab the blade flower seeds that TK Baja needs to season his meat, completing the last mission in this area. Not before running out of ammo and dying, though. On my way back from dying, I go grab the first data recorder, then continue getting lavender for TK's stew. It's the secret ingredient. After collecting the last blade flower, we run into a badass skag that gets us a huge chunk of XP, and it's just a few more seconds before I level up to level 9. Returning to TK Baja, we turn in our quest and finally get our first gun that isn't a pistol, TK's Wave. It's a shotgun with some unique pellets. At this point, I'm right at the cusp of level 10, and I figure with level up bonus damage, I could take out Bonehead. For those unaware, in Borderlands and Borderlands 2, for a short time after you level up, you get a significant damage bonus. It's usually very difficult to route around this, though, so most people don't try to get level ups before big fights. In our case, we are in a perfect position. We level up, get in Bonehead's face, and take him out, progressing us just a little bit further in the story, and getting us access to vehicles. Now, I'm going to do a little glitch that allows us to finish the Orbit Achieve challenge very easily. By positioning our car on the edge of this ramp so that the tires aren't touching the ground, letting it sit for a few seconds, then meleeing it and entering it at the same time, you can trick the game into thinking you've been airborne for a long time, getting you the challenge. This gives us a bunch of XP, which handily pushes us into level 11. Up until now, I've been putting all my skill points into impact for additional gun damage, but things are going to get harder pretty quickly, so I decide to put my next points into aid station, which makes it so my Scorpio turret now heals me in a small radius around it. The next few points, we'll be getting that up to max. From here, we grab all the missions we can for more experience, and answer Dr. Zed's summons. Zed says he wants us to kill some guy named Sledge. Okay. Turns out Sledge has locked himself in a mine, and we need to get the key. Sources say it's over at this wind farm, but when we get there, it turns out Sledge was one step ahead of us. A true master tactician. The key to the mine is actually in one of Sledge's hideouts, over in the arid hills. But that place is pretty scary. The enemies are much higher level, and I don't really have much going for me right now. Well, as it turns out, we can at least solve the level problem pretty easily. There's an area called the Lost Cave, which is the main area for the mission Shock Crystal Harvest. In this cave, there's a specific enemy called Crab Worms. They're big, they hit hard, but they also give good XP. 
and they have a tiny crit spot that, when hit, deals a whole bunch of extra damage. Even as underleveled as we are, if we hit that crit spot, we'll do decent enough damage to take them out. And this will be our XP farm. At least for now. While we're doing this, we're also going to collect some shot crystals, since completing that quest will grant us even more XP. I also try to do the Claptrap mission, which causes me to die a few times. Turning in Shot Crystal Harvest barely gets us to level 15, and now we're ready to go raid Sludge's safe house and get the Mine Gate key. In this area, I'm going to be making heavy use of an item that's exclusive to Borderlands 1, Med Kits. These are items that you can keep in your inventory and act as a slow, overtime heal when used. This is extremely useful to us, since we still don't have a shield. This healing, combined with the healing from our Scorpio turret, makes this area not too bad compared to normal gameplay. I grab the Claptrap mission, phase the repair kit through reality, and turn the mission in all in about 10 seconds. Then continue on, occasionally stopping to heal up when needed. Finally, we make it to where the key is being held, and it's being guarded by a very large man with a mask. By throwing out our Scorpio turret, we get him to focus on it, and take him out pretty easily. We get the key and get the hell out of Dodge. We use the key to open the gate and get into Headstone Mine. I decide to respec, putting 5 points into Impact and Metal Storm, and 1 point into Aid Station. It's right here that I realize I'm probably underleveled for this area and should complete some more quests. I grab the Titan's End Fast Travel Station, what hit the fan from Shep Sanders, and Scavenger Combat Rifle from Firestone. If it bothers you that I use vehicles in this run, I have an upcoming challenge run where I don't use vehicles that will probably make up for it. I grab the combat rifle parts, turn in what hit the fan, and head to do Circle of Death. We're a bit overleveled for the first mission in the Circle of Death series, but part two and three are close enough that the enemies are difficult and net good experience. The turret does a great job at keeping some of the enemies occupied while I use the bone shredder and the clipper to destroy all of the skags. The final set of enemies in this mission are level 18 alpha skags, with a chance at one of them being a fire alpha. Thankfully, they're both normal, making this mission fairly easy and getting us to level 17. Afterwards, we turn in scavenger combat rifle for a little more XP and get to headstone mine. People familiar with the speedrun of this game know exactly what's coming next. Instead of going through the area normally, we're going to be doing this grenade jump to skip a very large portion of headstone mine. You can actually get straight to Sledge after this jump, but I failed the jump and take the elevator of shame. Sledge is a very mixed bag. He's got an insane amount of health, does a lot of damage, and has many adds that spawn throughout the fight. However, there is a way to cheese him. By being close to him, but behind cover, he'll spam his AoE slam attack. But since we're behind cover, it won't hit us. This will allow us to safely whittle him down while he tries to fix that nail that's sticking out of the floor. With that done, we get one of the best weapons in the game, Sledge's shotgun. Even without drop reloading, this weapon is very powerful, if inaccurate. You practically have to be within spitting distance to do consistent damage, but when you are, it's not uncommon to one-shot normal enemies and take down badasses with relative ease. Turning in the mission to Zed, we get access to the Dull Headlands and hit level 18 from it. Here I decide to show an alternative way to get orbit achieved, by binding action skill slash vehicle boost to scroll wheel on a free scrolling mouse, you can boost off a ramp and then spam the boost to float in the air. You can do this on most jumps in the game, even the pisswash goalie jump, basically the same place where I did the glitch originally, but doing it here feels cooler. Also, don't try this on Borderlands 2, by the way. You'll actually just crash the game. Anyway, now we have to rescue Lucky, who gives us our next few missions. The badass bruiser guarding him is easy to take down with our new shotgun, and we rescue the soon-to-be-dead man. Now we have to turn on the fast travel network by simply flipping some breakers. I guess they had a thunderstorm. From here we get a bunch of new missions, but the only one we're interested in is Big Game Hunter. Grabbing the bait, placing it down, and fighting Skagzilla gets us a very nice chunk of experience, bringing us to level 19. This is going to be our next XP farm for a little while. But not before heading back to Ernest and turning in the mission to get Whitting's Elephant Gun. It's a powerful sniper rifle, but has no scope, making it fairly difficult to use at any significant range. Even so, the damage of an on-level weapon is super nice, and it having bonus grit from being a sniper rifle is even better. We head back to Skagzilla and make short work of him with our new toy, grabbing all the items dropped and then taking out some of Mad Mel's patrols on the way to Ghosts of the Vault. 
This mission has a couple of enemies that are also a nice smattering of experience. And it also gives us an explosive elemental artifact for our action skill. We encounter a badass psycho on the way to the mission and hit level 20 before encountering the three guardians in the area. We don't actually have to kill them to finish the mission, but they give so much XP that it's hard to turn down. From here, we save and quit, kill the rest of Mad Mel's patrols, and turn that mission in, allowing us to go and kill Mad Mel. Takes a couple of attempts, but sitting outside the arena and dealing some damage before heading in to finish off Mel gives us the exact advantage we needed. And finally, the game starts to really open up. The first thing we do is take the mission King Tossing and head over to the Tetanus Warrens. Here we'll be getting our first and pretty much only shield. King Wee Wee, at the end of the area, drops Wee Wee's Super Booster, a unique shield that boosts your max health and gives a small amount of health regen. And not only do we get that, but upon turning in the mission, we receive the Spy, a good Hyperion SMG with a crit bonus. In order to farm for a good one, I set my save file to read only, and get a very good one first try. For those wondering why some uniques can come in different rarities, the rarity system in Borderlands 1 is different from later games, as the parts the gun has themselves determine the rarity of the gun. Generally, better parts contribute towards a higher rarity, while worse parts will reduce the rarity. This is why the uniques can show up as a range, and why the rarity you get actually means something. Anyway, with that out of the way, we can now start the second half of the game. Yep, we're only halfway through the base game. We get into Rust Commons West to find Tannis, and attempt to get a Crack Sash on the way. Rakanishu absolutely destroys us, as the penalty to damage from being underleveled in this game is brutal. Well, at least it's not like it's better than the Super Booster anyway. We can just head to Tannis, finding an amazing chest with items we can't use, and turn in the quest to find her, and get the quest to meet the second best character in this game. We get the double hole in one, grab Scooter's used car parts, and the firepower invoice to get some extra XP when we get back to New Haven. All this leading up to Crazy Earl's place, where we meet him, then immediately get back to New Haven to turn in those quests and get a level up. At some point, I started specking into Refire to reduce the cooldown of the Scorpio turret, and here I decided it probably wasn't worthwhile, and I should instead grab Scatter Shot to boost the damage of Sludge's shotgun. We head back to Earl's Scrapyard to get rid of all them pests, and on the way, do the Claptrap Rescue mission for some more inventory slots and XP. Thankfully for us, this area is perfectly on level, so getting through all the enemies isn't too difficult. We finish Get Off My Lawn and head over to grab some explosives. I find this grenadeless version of the skip. Not sure if it's well known, but I think it's pretty cool. I grab the charge, place it, and save and quit to get back faster. At this point, I'm so close to hitting level 24 and being able to use the spy that I do the second part of the firepower quest line to push me over the boundary. Unfortunately, after turning in the mission, we're still just short of level 24, so we go pick up the quest, Jack's Other Eye, for the XP, and also the unique weapon, the Mad Jack. It's a decently powerful explosive revolver with a very unfortunate snaking bullet that makes it very hard to hit enemies. While showing it off, we finally hit level 24. On top of that, we can also turn in the mission to get the Sentinel, a Hyperion combat rifle that does decent damage. And in this version of the game, it can spawn with an accessory, meaning we can get one in an element or even get bonus crit damage. For some reason, they remove that in the Enhanced Edition. More like oh, dehanced, am I right? We get our crit damage sentinel and head off to grab Crazy Earl's beer. After collecting those, Earl informs us that he doesn't actually have a piece of the vault key and that it was stolen from him by Krom. He stabbed him twice. Also, enjoy this clip. Legalize nuclear pussy. We hit level 25 doing the middle of nowhere no more quest line, allowing us to max out all of our important skills and putting us on level for killing Krom. With our new weapons, we head to Krom's Canyon. Our first stop is actually in the opposite direction from Krom, and that is Reaver. Reaver drops the Reaver's Edge, a sniper rifle that actually has a scope, which will replace our elephant gun. On the way, we hit level 26 and fix up this claptrap to get some more inventory space. Reaver is a really easy fight. You can get up in his face, deal a bunch of crits, and get Reaver's Edge, the special effect of which is having an insane amount of zoom. With his new item added to our arsenal, we head over to Krom to get his sidearm. This is a very interesting fight compared to most in this game. Krom is situated at the very end of this canyon on a turret and is constantly pelting you with bullets and rockets. Ideally, you want to either snipe him from far away 
or do like we did with Reaver and get right up in his face. The turret has a slow turning speed, making it easy to circle strafe around him to avoid damage, but in order to do that, we first have to get through these sections of bandit camps. In my opinion, it's one of the cooler fights in the game, but it can be pretty frustrating if you don't take your time and know how to use cover. With that tangent out of the way, we take down Krom rather easily, getting another piece of the vault key and another unique weapon, Krom's sidearm. It's a slightly better than average repeater that always comes in shock. Back to Tannis to turn in that mission, and now we have to go into the Janus Town section of the game. First, we have to kill Janus Cobb, an enemy that drops a unique weapon but doesn't respawn. I set my save file to read only, and prepare to kill him a number of times to get a good variant of his weapon, only to get a rather decent one first try. The meat grinder will always be, have terrible accuracy, so if you want to see if you have a good one, just check the rate of fire and damage. I got one with corrosive damage and decent fire rate, which was pretty much all I wanted, since we were going to be fighting against the Crimson Lance soon. Now, we go do the hardest mission of the game, followed by the second hardest mission of the game, and the third hardest mission of the game, all that culminating in needing to go back to Taylor Cobb and kill him. I'm gonna make a quick detour over to Treasure's Landing in order to do Wanted Fresh Fish and get a unique rocket launcher, the Leviathan. We also do I've Got a Sinking Feeling for a bit of extra XP on the way, and return to New Haven to turn in these quests, reaching level 28. Once again, I set up for read only farming and get a good corrosive one first try. And now it's time for Taylor Cobb. This fight is notoriously difficult. You can cheese it by bringing a car into the arena, but I decided to do the fight normally, and died twice before getting the kill. He drops the roaster, which I didn't pick up for some reason, but I doubt I would have used it even if I did. Regardless, our real reward for doing this mission is this claptrap. Without a master, I have two options. I can listen to you move your disgusting meat flaps, or I can stick an electrode up my back panel and call it paradise. I will comply with what you need. Then get out of my scan range. After turning this mission in, there's a neat Easter egg you can get where you enter this building in New Haven and can take an elevator down. At the bottom, there are a bunch of level 30 psychos and chests, one of which contains the Ryder sniper rifle. It has a much larger magazine and rate of fire compared to most other sniper rifles, but much lower damage. Also, like the elephant gun, it doesn't have a scope. It's not that great of a weapon, but it's unique, and it's free. We head back to Trash Coast, and I respect to get some ammo regeneration for the next fight. Not much to say about Rackhive. It's a big sponge enemy that can't really hurt you as long as you stay on this ledge. You just gotta watch out for the rack spawns. We level up off the kill, get the vault key piece, and turn it into Tannis. The next mission requires us to go through Old Haven, an area filled with Crimson Lance soldiers. They have armor and take reduced damage from bullets, but are very vulnerable to elemental damage, especially corrosive. My main strategy here was to get really up close and personal with the meat grinder, but that didn't fare so well, so I swapped to the Leviathan, which gave me a bit more range to work with. We rescue Tannis' Claptrap and repair the other Claptrap in the area, giving a nice total of 33 inventory slots. At this point, I'm fairly certain I could rush to the end of the game, but instead I wanted to do some extra quests to get some cool unique weapons. The first one I wanted to get was actually a hybrid. Hybrids are items that have a unique part and the part of another different special kind of weapon. Like the Dove Hornet, the Bone Shredder Savior, the Rhino Roaster, etc. The one I wanted was the Dove Hornet. You get the Dove from turning in the final mission in the Alter Ego quest line and by saving and quitting on either a read-only save file, or doing it fast enough that the game doesn't make a new save, you can have infinite attempts at it. The special effect of the dove is that it doesn't consume ammo, at all. While the Hornet is a very nice corrosive weapon that has a three pellet burst. When you combine the two, you get a very nice corrosive repeater pistol with effectively infinite ammo. We get one after just 20 tries, and at this point I decide that I want to get one of the most obscure unique weapons in the game. I head over to the Ned DLC and get stinkied by the weirdest grenade ever. The unique weapon we're here for is at the very end of the DLC, so we're going to have to go through the whole thing to get a weapon that's probably not worth it. There's not so much to mention about this DLC, a lot of the content that's worth seeing in it is the side missions, and I skip all them in favor of getting the one item that I came here for. I do level up once in Dead Haven and realize while waiting around for the evacuation that the roaster would have been a good weapon to have. Oh, I should have picked up the roaster. I forgot to pick up the roaster. 
Finally, I get all the way to Ned, only for his weapon to get deleted by the game, because it was above this small section of floor that gets removed after the first part of the boss. I could have just continued without the item and finished the DLC, but it felt weird not getting it, so I quit without saving and ran all the way back to kill Ned again. Then we take it down Undead Ned after only one death. I also learned that you can push Undead Ned around with knockback weapons like Sledger's Shotgun. <laughs> Speaking of knockback with Sledger's Shotgun, we head back to the main story and get to the Salt Flats. We kill the four bandit patrols, fix up the claptrap, and head to the elevator to face off against Baron Flint. I opt to not skip Hans and Franz for a bit of extra XP and kill the big boss with the spy. What? You thought I was going to launch him off with sledges? Sorry. I wanted his boomstick. While I was heading to the back door, Jolt's dude reminded me that the blister existed, and I decided to go grab that real quick. Since that would be another corrosive weapon for our fight against the Lance. We get through the back door easily with the help of some lubrication, and fight Master McCloud. Our Dove Hornet makes quick work of him and his lackeys, surprising nobody, and we get to the Crimson Fastness with no issues. In the Fastness, we make short work of all the Lance with our many corrosive weapons, find Tannis, and head to the Crimson Enclave to activate that Echo Network. After flipping all three switches and turning in the mission, we finally get to the last little section of main game. We run through the descent, use our Shock Boomstick to get some XP in the Iridian Promontory, allowing us to hit level 35, and run through the rest of the promontory to get to the vault. Steel gets introduced to the furry community's favorite fetish, and we get introduced to the final boss. The Destroyer isn't a terribly difficult fight, so long as you're able to do some decent critical hit damage, you can usually kill it pretty quickly. If you want to kill the Destroyer very quickly, just lob bouncing Bettys into his mouth. However, we don't have that luxury in this challenge, so we're stuck with old-fashioned guns. And that's the main game of Borderlands. But stick around, because we still have two more DLCs to finish. Before heading to the first DLC, I go ahead and grab a couple more of the unique weapons left in the main game, just to have a few more options. Those weapons are the Patton and Nailer, a revolver and sniper rifle, respectively. With all that, we're ready to head to T-Bone Junction, and raid the secret armory of General Knox. The DLC starts out like normal. We grab some car parts, get attacked by the local acrobats, and download a car. Next, we gotta go all over creation in some of the largest maps this game has to offer. Uh, unfortunately, large does not equal well populated, and most of our time is spent driving on relatively empty roads. I also forgot to grab core collection before heading out, making my life just that much more difficult. Working in our favor, however, we have a good stock of corrosive weapons, and are able to bring these chumps down before they're able to pose too much of a threat. This won't be the case for the whole DLC though, as there's a good amount of enemies that resist corrosive damage. However, we'll leave those problems for the future and head over to Moxie. I blew my load a little too early, but recovered quickly enough to join the group session going on outside. Innuendo. We turn in Moxie's mission and leave the place immediately because women are scary. Saving and quitting gets us back to T-Bone Junction faster than going back normally, so that's what we do. After meeting Moxie, we get access to a new vehicle. The Racer, which moves a little bit faster and makes this DLC a little more bearable. On this road, we've got to clear two roadblocks in order to access Lockdown Palace and save Athena. Earlier I mentioned the only class mods that I'd allow were available in this DLC. Roland's Marine class mod drops from the badass variant of the Devastator enemy, which is deceptively rare in itself. The online resource Loodle mod shows that the chance of it dropping from a single badass Devastator being about 20%. We could do three of the Circle of Duty quests and get a guaranteed one, but that's fairly out of the way, and if I did that, I'd probably want to farm a good one, which would no doubt add another few hours to the run. All that to say, it's unlikely I'll get one. We clear out the second roadblock and head into the Sunken Sea where we can grab the Purple Juice quest. Purple Juice rewards us with a unique pistol called the Chiquito Amigo. It's a fairly decent gun, but more importantly, it's on level. We quickly hit the four valves and get our reward, heading immediately to Lockdown Palace afterward. We get through most of it fairly easily until this section with the two badass thugs. After we die, we find the Mega Locker, an amalgamation of three lockers in one. One even containing a truckskin wrestler. Anyway, we get back to the area with the two thugs and take our time, putting corrosion and fire on them and waiting behind cover. We hit level 39 and jump in to fight Mr. Shank right afterward. Shank is like the opposite of Sledge. He moves fast, has a really tanky shield, and hits with fast and low damage melee attacks. Using Krom's sidearm, we take care of his shield, then switch to the blister to deal off the finishing blow. All that's left to do now is go find Athena, and we've finished this mission. 
before saving and quitting, there's a couple more things we can do here. First of which is killing Chaz, who drops a higher level Bone Shredder. Chaz, like Bonehead, has an insane amount of HP and deals a ton of damage. It takes a couple of tries, but after using my brain and not running in head first, we kill Chaz and get a very lackluster Bone Shredder. The second thing we can do here is turn in the Claptrap mission for an attempt at a random backpack SDU. We didn't get it this time, but it's not a huge loss since we're almost done with this playthrough anyway. Also, we get to see this. Damn it! Just kill me! <laughs> Saving and quitting to get back to T-Bone Junction, we meet up with Athena and grab the Codebreaker mission. We also grab the Bitch's Payback, a mission for killing the two named enemies Kairos and Typhon, who drop Kairos' power and the Typhoon respectively. Both of these enemies have very large health pools, but if you utilize elemental damage properly, they should go down pretty easily. That's a pretty big theme for this DLC. Kairos takes a few tries since his sniper rifle deals insane damage, and I don't have very high damage output, but we get him down on the third try, and Minerva's squad shows up to celebrate. Now it's ice cream day. Best part of the DLC right there. Anyway, this bit of dialogue lets us know that the access code to Nox's big, super secure cache of weapons was left at a tourist trap. We're already pretty close to it, but we're also close to Typhon, so we'll do that first. Commander Typhon's drop, the Typhoon, is a decent SMG with bullets that bounce all over the goddamn place and split after they travel for a bit. It's similar to Ned's SMG, but is a lot more accurate and actually has a name and flavor text. We head over to the world's largest bullet and grab the code for the armory that was so carelessly left here by Derek the Lanceman, and save quit. All we have to do now is grab the detonator from Athena, head over to the Deep Fathoms, activate the bridge to Rhodes End, meet Ceresia squad, kill Ajax, fail multiple times, eventually get his spear, greet Helicon squad, run past a bunch of land soldiers, and by run past I mean kill, get a Gemini, and finally make it to the armory where we can fight the final boss of the DLC the titular General Knox. Knox, much like the Destroyer, is pretty tanky but takes good critical hit damage. He's also pretty much immune to elemental and splash damage, so we're going to be using Ajax's spear for our primary damage. Even though we can't use any of the loot, I decided to clip into the armory just for the fun of it to see what I get. In total, I got a volcano, an equalizer, a hornet, a bulldog, another equalizer, a very good hammer, and a revolution. After getting all the chests, you have to get out by unaliving yourself to get back to the area where you place the detonator. And so, we place the detonator, wait two and a half minutes or so, and become a red smear on the sand. And that finishes the General Knox DLC. There's one more unique weapon in this DLC that I didn't get, but it would have required going far out of my way, and doing some grinding, and given how good my set of weapons already is, I didn't think it was necessary. And now, for the Claptrap Revolution. At this point, we're pretty overleveled and have pretty decent gear, so this is more of a victory lap. Upon meeting Tannis, she tells us she's trying to build a gaming PC and needs parts, so we try to help by grabbing five motherboards. While doing so, we kill a bunch of Hyperion employees. Turns out, they were trying to contact us about dealing with a Claptrap uprising that's currently happening. They tell us to head to Sanders Gorge to restore a power plant or something. I don't know. But this maze area sucks. If you follow the lights, it's easy enough, but it's still a pretty long trek. Even though we are overleveled, the Kamikaze Claptrap still basically one-shot us, so that's fun. Surely that won't become an issue later. At some point in the Nox DLC, I respect for more survivability, so this is what my skill tree looks like now. In all truthfulness, I probably should have taken points from Quick Charge and put them into stat, since our shield is falling off significantly, but it's whatever. Just wanted to point that out so nobody's confused as to why I suddenly have quick charge and stat, but no refire. After getting to the power plant, we greet the three turrets with our best Dick Cheney impression. That reference is still relevant, right? Anyway, we enter the place and find that Claptrap has been reviving our former enemies for the sake of his twisted machinations. Nox is back, baby. We kill him in about a minute, turn on the power, and get oh. our vengeance. Heading back to Tartar Saw Station, Blake says Claptrap is using the nearby factory to do... something. I'll be honest, it's been a long time since I've actually paid attention to these DLC storylines, 
so a lot of the details have been forgotten in favor of much more important information, like the difference between affect and effect, or Lilith's bust size. We need to get to the factory in order to see our second revived foe, Dr. Ned, who doesn't have a unique weapon this time around. He's pretty easily defeated, and we're free to go destroy the factory or something. Saving and quitting brings us back, and we respec out of quick charge and into refire, because I finally grew a brain. We head back to Blake and find that, oh no, bandits are attacking tartar sauce. Well, not my problem. We can just ignore them and turn in the mission. The next mission has us going through this whole canyon area, but we can skip a good amount of it by grenade jumping over this fence and following these catwalks. You don't actually want to follow them all the way, you want to jump off about right here, since going any further just leads you to a dead end, which I totally didn't do because I was absentmindedly running. We get to the warehouse, and the next crime against nature that Claptrap has in store for us is Commandant Steel herself. She's just a reskin Lance assassin from the Nox DLC, so the best way to take them out are pretty much the same. Lots of damage over time. We break her spine and grab the wired device, which is supposed to be the weapon that is able to stop all this nonsense. We head off to the last area, Wayward Pass, and get a volcano on the way. This area kind of acts like a boss rush, having us refight all the bosses from this DLC. The first fight is Nox again, but instead of him spawning in melee claptraps, he spawns in those kamikaze claptraps. Remember? The ones that one-shot us? The sneaky little assholes, pretty much entirely silent, took the martyr dump perk. So even if you kill them, they can still kill you! And because he spawns them so often, I ended up dying four times and spent all of my ammo doing so, forcing me to resort to the Dove Hornet. After a solid 10 minutes, we finally take him down and can head to the next boss, Undead Ned. Ned also summons Kamikaze Claptraps, but only one at a time, so this fight isn't nearly as difficult. Next is Steel, who doesn't spawn in anything and just melts to corrosion, so not much to say there. And finally, we make it back to the arid badlands and meet the final boss, Marcus. I mean, Claptrap. If you've played Borderlands 2, this fight is a lot like the piston fight from the Torg DLC where you have to kill the giant robot in order to get to the juicy center of the Tootsie Pop. It's also super weak to corrosion, so the Dev Hornet carries yet again. And the same goes for Claptrap himself. And that's all of Borderlands, done with only unique weapons and items. All in all, this wasn't a super difficult challenge. It had its highs and lows, but it was very fun all around. I hope you enjoyed it. And even if you didn't, I hope you learned something new. This is my favorite game in the Borderlands franchise, probably mostly due to nostalgia, but there's a lot of niche and interesting mechanics in it that don't really carry over to the other games. If you want to see more content like this, feel free to subscribe, like, and all that other good stuff. I also stream this entire playthrough over on my Twitch, which you can find in the description below. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you guys next time. They tell us to hand a Sanders. They tell us to hand a Sanders Gorge. They tell us to head to Sanders Gorge. They tell us to head to Sanders Gorge.